We continue our series on the history of local communities in the North Central Television viewing area. This week, we head to Eastern Macon County and check in on the very historic town of Red Boiling Springs. Around 1,200 people call Red Boiling Springs home. The city wasn't incorporated until 1953, but local historians say they can go back at least until the early 1800s to learn about this area's beginning. We know, for one thing, the Indians were here. We know that because you can find the artifacts all over the place. But beyond, uh, beyond that, what we can really uh, document is um, goes back to 1819 when Samuel Jones bought 400 acres, which basically is the area that Red Boiling Springs um, is now. Um, uh, he did that in 1819. A lot of people say he discovered the first mineral springs. There's a lot of controversy over who actually was the discoverer, but, but we do know the springs were on his property. There was also a salt lick on his property and there was a saltpeter cave on his property. So that's, that's about as far back as we, go, we can go and document. He kept it his entire life, and then it, uh, it went to his uh, wife and son, and they ended up selling about 36 acres, I think it was, to a man from Gainsborough named, uh, his last name was Hare, and he actually saw the uh, value, the economic value, in the mineral springs and uh, how he could actually do a business. So he bought uh, the property that had the original, what they called the Little Red uh, Spring. He bought that and built a tavern house, they called it, which had a dining room in it and a whole string of little cabins um, beside it for people to come to his watering place, is, is how he referred to it and started advertising. And so people started coming in the late 1840s, you know, and, uh, and, and that went on. Um, he took on some partners, he sold his interest, uh, but that, uh, that sort of thing went on right up till the Civil War. And then we had a little break in the economy. You know. uh, so um, uh, that was how we got started. After the Civil War interrupted the popularity of coming to this area, people started visiting the Macon County community once again in big numbers. The real boom, uh, beyond what Mr. Hare and Mr. O'Shaughnessy had built, would be with the Cloyd in 1890. Uh, the first Donahoe, there have been two Donahoe hotels. The first one was 1900, and then the Arlington, which is where um, Cycle Mose uh, is now, uh, was built in 1908. So that was the start of the building of uh, hotels in the town. And all of them lined um, the creeks that run through, through the town. At one point, we usually will just say there were nine hotels and a dozen boarding houses or more, but actually there were more than nine hotels. Uh, some of them uh, were small, but um, that, uh, there was, 12 or 13, I think, uh, at the peak of uh, hotels. My favorite name when it comes to hotels is the Idle Hour Hotel. I'm not real sure what that meant, <laughs> but, I, but it was different. Uh, most of the hotels were named after who built it or who was running it. The first hotel, the one that Mr. Hare built and then Mr. O'Shaughnessy ran, it really never had a name. Uh, people just called it by whoever was managing it or running it at the time. Uh, it got known as Bledsoe's Hotel and Deadman's Hotel and, and uh, whoever, you know. That, but it never really had a name. And when they advertise, they advertise, come to the Red Boiling Springs. It, they were calling people to come to the water, not to come to a town, not to come to a specific hotel, but to come for the water. Boy, did they come for the water by the thousands. The belief was the mineral water helped heal those who were sick. One year, especially, saw huge crowds here. 1920s uh, into the early 30s was probably the peak time. And they, 
And people did come by the thousands, even during the Depression. One year there were 14,000 people uh, in town. In the hotels, that doesn't count who came to the boarding houses or who slept in their cars because that was known to happen, um, or who just put up cots in the hallways at the hotels. Uh, but 14,000 people in the middle of a depression still came to Red Boiling Springs. What fascinates me the most is early on the roads were horrible and you had to travel a long time to get here. So even people in Nashville, they might be able to take the train to Hartsville, but then they either had to come by a wagon or later by the Model T, Model A uh, cabs that the Knight uh, brothers had. Uh, and so that it'd be a two-day trip where it takes us two hours to go to Nashville. They spent two days trying to get here. And when they got here, they were dirty. And so there were, every hotel had somebody hired to go out and brush them off when they got out of the cars or off the wagons and stuff. So that fascinates me that they still would come. But when they came, they came and stayed. They didn't just come for a night. They, they came for a week, a month, the whole season. So, uh, we, we find postcards every once in a while that will say, I'm here all summer, or I'll be here till September, or something like that. So they came f to stay for a while. But with the boom, there's usually a bust. Local historian Rita Watson says the Depression did not help, and only those who could afford to come here would. Also, World War II played a major role in declining attendance with a sinking economy. And finally, when roads started improving, people had other travel options, and suddenly, Red Boiling Springs was no longer a popular travel destination. Today, three of the original hotels still stand. We have the Armor, which has the only mineral bathhouse left in the state of Tennessee. Uh, and uh, it's under new ownership. Uh, Callie and, uh, Efros and her husband Mark own it. And they're getting uh, their feet wet in uh, the hotel business, and they're doing very good. Uh, then we have the Donahoe. And um, it's been remodeled within the last um, five, six years or so, and it's do, it does very well as a wedding venue, and of course they do the uh, old style, family style cooking that everybody loves, and they also have the entertainment center, and Ronnie McDowell's there a lot, and he brings friends along with him, and so uh, they're doing well. And the Thomas House, which was the Cloyd way back then, um, uh, it's known, this, this is uh, a real change for most of us, but it's known for its ghost hunts. Now, and they also do dinner theaters, but probably the thing it's known for right now is um, its list of ghosts that you can um, spend a night and maybe you'll get an experience with one of the ghosts, you know. Most of you probably know this town was not named for a person but for the abundant mineral springs in the area. 1829, they named the post office, Salt Lake Creek Post Office. And then in um, 1847, after we became part of Macon County, we became Macon County in 44, I think. In 47, they changed it to uh, Red Boiling Springs because that's pretty much what everybody was calling the area. And so they changed it to Red Boiling Springs. But then in um, 92, um, the courts decided that Red Boiling Springs was a trade name. And so then the post office decided it would make a slight change and Red Boiling became one word. So we were Red Boiling Springs. <laughs> And we stayed that way until 1941 when they decided they could go back to Red Boiling Springs. And, and just to clarify, the reason they call it Red Boiling Springs is because the water had a slightly red tint to it and the sediment that would drop out would be red. And it bubbled up out of the ground originally. There was enough pressure on uh, the spring that it would bubble up so it looked like it was boiling. It, it hadn't done that. And, 
long, long time. But, um, but that's, it was never hot. I gotta clarify that. It was never hot water. It was not a hot springs. A lot of people think because it says boiling that it was a hot springs, but it wasn't, so. It seems most any city will suffer hardships from time to time. Perhaps the most recent tragedy to strike here was the 1969 flood. It destroyed businesses and, sadly, took the lives of two young girls. As a result of the flood, city leaders decided to build two covered bridges as a reminder of the city's past. They are a popular tourism draw to this day. Speaking of tourism, could Red Boiling Springs ever return to its glory days? People don't understand uh, how important tourism is, but Red Boiling could, could still play on that. We're trying to create a museum so people can see the history. We've got three uh, wonderful hotels. We've got a great entertainment center uh, going. We've got uh, wonderful parks. Um, we've got a new park that's got a big walking track and it's gonna have all sorts of uh, exercise equipment and stuff. It'd still be a great place to come and uh, spend time. Uh, I think if we had enough um, property owners to really put their mind to it uh, and if the city and the county would help uh, advertise, um, you know, we've got a hotel motel tax now and I, I believe the state passed a law. I'm not sure that it, it would affect Macon County because uh, it's been in place longer, but that a certain percentage of that tax is to be spent on promoting tourism uh, in your county. If our county would comply with that, we could bring a lot of, of tourism back. We have a wo wonderful art council in Macon County. Mm -hmm. Th they bring the Nashville Symphony to the parks. Mm -hmm. They, you know, all of that is tourism, you know. Uh, when, when they bring the young Americans and our kids get to participate in that, that's tourism. Uh, uh, hillbilly days, folk medicine festival, all of that is tourism and it all boosts our economy here. It's the best money Macon County and Red Bottom Springs can get is tourism money. Uh, yeah, we could do it again. Next week, we'll head to Smith County and learn about the history of defeated. Reporting from Lafayette, Barry Hyatt, NCTV.